Now, I don't know where I'll end up sitting. We may have to build that wall yet. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm, I'm hoping it'll still be in the room. I put out for Somewhere. bids. <laughs> so I'll Good. let you know. Good. <clears throat> Everybody ready? Mm-hmm. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the organizational meeting of the Sherburne County Board of Commissioners, uh, seated this day, January 5th, 2021. We will start uh, this meeting with a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance, if everybody would be willing to stand as you are able. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The first order of business for today is to approve the regular meeting proposed agenda as prepared, and the facilitator would entertain a motion to approve. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Moved by Commissioner Danielowski, seconded by Commissioner Brandt. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The agenda is approved. The second order of business is to conduct the oaths of office for Sherburne County Commissioner. We have with us uh, to help us with the uh, oath of office, Judge Buccaconi. Thank you, Judge, for joining us. The first uh, swearing in will be for Commissioner Barbara Barant. Commissioner, if you would like to come forward here to the center. I'll have you raise your right hand and please repeat after me. I, Barbara Barant. I, Barbara Barant. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. That I will faithfully and impartially discharge. That I will faithfully and impartially discharge. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. Of Sherburne County Commissioner. Of Sherburne County Commissioner. To the best of my knowledge and ability. To the best of my knowledge and ability. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. The next commissioner to be uh, undertake the oath of office is Commissioner Tim Dolan. See if I can get through this without fogging up my glasses. Have you raised your right hand? And repeat after me. I, Timothy Dolan. I, Timothy Dolan. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. Of Sherburne County Commissioner. Of Sherburne County Commissioner. To the best of my knowledge and ability. To the best of my knowledge and ability. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. And our third of oath, oath of office will be for Commissioner Lisa Foley. Hand and repeat after me. I, Lisa Foby. I, Lisa Foby, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge. And that I will faithfully and partially impartially discharge the duties of the office. The duties of the office of Sherburne County Commissioner. Of Sherburne County Commissioner. To the best of my knowledge and ability. To the best of my knowledge and ability. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. (coughs) 
And now if uh, Commissioner Barant would come forward and sign the oath of office with the judge. <laughs> we got you for two more signatures later there. <clears throat> and next, Commissioner Dolan. <laughs> you notice we have two left handers already. So. And Commissioner Foby. On behalf of Sherburne County, its residents, its businesses, as well as the staff of Sherburne County King Commissioners, we'd like to congratulate you on your election and your oath of office and certification. <laughs> Judge Buchiconi, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Judge. Thanks, Judge. Thank you. The next order of business is to elect a chairperson for the Sherburne County Board of Commissioners for the uh, year 2021. At this time, the facilitator would entertain a uh, motion or recommendation from the floor for a nomination for chair. I motion Ray Ann Danielski to be our board chair. There's a motion for chair for Commissioner Danielowski. Is there a second? I'll second. Are there any other nominations from the floor? Any other nominations from the floor? Seeing none, the facilitator will close nominations. All those in favor of Rayanne Danielowski serving as chair of the Sherburne County Board of Commissioners for 2021, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay? So passed. At this point, uh, Commissioner Danielowski, congratulations. I will you. let you start the meeting and I'll find the gavel for you there. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you for uh, putting that trust in me to be the county board chair for 2021. Moving on now for um, the election of the board vice chair, um, I will be calling for nominations for the vice chair for Sherburne County for 2021. Madam Chair, I'd nominate uh, Barbara Barant. Okay. Is there a second to that? I will second. All right. Are there any other nominations from the floor? Any other nominations from the floor? Any other nominations from the floor? Hearing none, then I would, um, all those in favor of Barbara Brandt for our vice chair for Sherburn County of 2021, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Congratulations, Barb. Thank you. A smooth transfer of power. <laughs> <laughs> nice <Take> job. <laughs> <laughs> there should be some people taking notes. Of this. I agree. All right. Um, moving on then to our consent agenda. <clears throat> any items on the consent agenda can be removed by anybody from the public, um, the board for separate consideration. If there is none, I would uh, be looking for a motion to approve our consent agenda. 
Madam Chair, I'll move approval of the consent agenda as presented. Motion made by Commissioner Dolan. Seconded by Commissioner Brandt. Any further discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. All right, moving on to, do we have any announcements? Bruce. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, first of all, a reminder, uh, we are scheduled to have a special meeting on Thursday morning uh, to discuss legislative issues and topics with our delegation for the <coughs> state legislature. Uh, we'll also have a couple of representatives from the federal uh, offices as well participating but more observing. Uh, as of this morning, everybody has tentatively accepted for summer portion of the uh, breakfast other than one who we will follow up with today. Uh, after board's discussion this morning regarding legislative priorities, we'll finalize that list and have that prepared for Thursday. A little different this year, uh, instead of having every department director present, just given the structure and the format and not having the retreat format, we will just focus on whatever priority projects you select today uh, for the discussion. Uh, as of now, that's five items. And, uh, and then again, that'll be modified uh, how you uh, make your final decision today. Uh, and then the second note, uh, if the board is still uh, flexible, we'll see what happens. We do have scheduled uh, the second meeting of the board for the 19th of January. However, uh, given the, the rapidity with which things are changing with COVID, it is possible we may need a special session next week and we'll let you know. All right, thank you. All right, moving on to open forum. Keisha, has anybody signed up for open forum? There is nobody signed up, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Okay, at this time then, we're going to recess our regular meeting and open the Housing and Redevelopment Authority meeting. Michelle, Diane? Madam Chair, I make a motion that we declare the 2021 Chair and Vice Chair for the HRA to be the same as the County Board. There's a motion on the table. Do I have a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, might be appropriate should first if we should do the oath of office first so okay. that we could vote, if that's all right with everybody. All right. Um, and with uh, permission of the chair, we can facilitate that like we did with the uh, oaths for commissioners. Okay. <clears throat> uh, with that, the first person to come up and take the oath of office for the uh, Housing and Redevelopment Authority uh, will be uh, Commissioner uh, Barant. Good morning. Good morning. Raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I, Barbara Brandt. I, Barbara Brandt. Who solemnly swear. Who solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution. Of the United States. Of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And that I will faithfully and impartially. And that I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Of the office. Of the office. Of Sherburn County Housing and Redevelopment Authority. Of Sherburn County Housing and Redevelopment Authority. To the best of my knowledge and ability. To the best of my knowledge and ability. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Thank you. And then we do have uh, Barbara, if you'd like to come sign here. And also signing these will be the oh. auditor treasurer. <laughs> we have an extra pen for you, so. You will sign yeah, this one. one, and then Michelle will sign here, and Diane will sign here. I'm like doing all at once at one time. 
No, we get to keep them for now. So. <laughs> Our second commissioner to be sworn in is uh, Commissioner Tim Dolan. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And that I will faithfully and impartially. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties. Discharge the duties of the Office of Sherburne County Housing and Redevelopment Authority. Of the Office of Sherburne County Housing and Redevelopment Authority. To the best of my knowledge and ability. To the best of my knowledge and ability. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Well, you never know. You might be jumping the gun again. <laughs> I think we all have to get sworn in. Grant is B. Tim is D. What? And next is the oath of office for Commissioner Lisa Foby. Times like this, I wish I knew my alphabet. <laughs> the struggle's real. I, Lisa Foby, I, Lisa Foby, do solemnly <clears throat> swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And that I will faithfully and impartially. And I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties. Discharge the duties of the Office of Sherburne County Housing and Redevelopment Authority. Of Sherburne County Housing and Redevelopment Authority. To the best of my knowledge and ability. To the best of my knowledge and abil ability. So help me God. So help me God. Madam Chair, members of the Commission, the Housing and Redevelopment Authority is so sworn in and seated. Thank you. All right, then, so we'd be looking for a motion now. Do I need to make the motion, or do we vote on the motion now, or it's all done? It, 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 with the board's permission, we should probably have the motion remade since you're now fully seated, okay. so made and second again. All right, I would be looking for that motion. I'll make a motion that we, we declare the 2021 chair and vice chair for the HRA to be the same as the county board. I will second. I have a motion by Commissioner Foby and a second by Commissioner Dolan to have the 2021 chair and vice chair for the HRA to be the same as the county board and the county board to be the HRA body. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Now we'd be looking to approve the minutes from the January 7th, 2020 HRA annual meeting. Madam Chair, I'll move approval of those minutes. Motion made by Commissioner Dolan. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same, same sign. That motion carries. Now we're looking to do the 2021 Housing and Redevelopment Authority meeting schedule. Everybody see that in their packets? So the next meeting would be Bruce when for next year set. Um, Madam Chair, the next annual Housing and Re Redevelopment Authority meeting will be set for January 4th, 2022. All right. Thank you. I'll make that motion. Motion made by Commissioner Dolan, or sorry, Commissioner <laughs> Foby. She could only be so lucky. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Th
Do I have a second? I'll second. And second made by Commissioner Dolan. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. All right. Uh, Madam Chair, before you recess, um, I just want to make sure we had a proper vote on item three, which was the meeting schedule, as well as the next annual meeting. Okay, so then I need to ask for the meeting schedule Correct. to be adopted. Correct. All right, looking for a motion then to adopt the uh, meeting schedule for the Redevelopment Authority for 2021. So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Schmeezing. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. All right, now we can adjourn the redevelopment housing authority meeting and open our regional rail meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Uh, with the commission's uh, permission, we will administer the oaths of office in the same uh, format that we just did. So the first commissioner to take the oath of office is Commissioner Barbara Brandt. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Barbara Barant. I, Barbara Barant. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And that I will faithfully and impartially. And that I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Of the Office of Sherburne County Regional Rail Authority of the Office of Sherburne County Regional Rail Authority. To the best of my knowledge and ability. To the best of my knowledge and ability. So help me God. So help me God. Next is Commissioner Dolan. I, Timothy Dolan. I, Timothy Dolan. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And that I will faithfully and impartially. And that I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Of the Office of Sherburne County Regional Rail Authority. Of the Office of Sherburne County Regional Rail Authority. To the best of my knowledge and ability. To the best of my knowledge and ability. So help me God. So help me God. And Commissioner Lisa Foby. I, Lisa Foby. I, Lisa Foby, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And that I will faithfully and impartially. And I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties. Discharge the duties of the Office of Sherburn County Regional Rail Authority. Of the Office of Sherburn County Regional Rail Authority. To the best of my knowledge and ability. To the best of my, my knowledge and ability. So help me God. So help me God. And now we will have the auditor treasurer certify these and then we will be good to go. They're doing that, Bruce. Oh, Can we do the vote? Isn't that cute? Um, <laughs> it's cute. Are you yeah. on a wave? It just took one second. Okay. I didn't see the picture. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the commission, the regional rail authority is so seated and uh, sworn in.
Great, then I would be looking for a motion to approve the 2021 Regional Rail Authority Chair and Vice Chair to be the same as the County Board of Commissioners. So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Dolan. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. <coughs> So then we will now approve the regional rail meeting minutes of December 15th, 2020. I'd be looking for that motion. So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Schmeezy. Seconded by Commissioner Brandt. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. I'll be looking to establish the 2021 Regional Rail Authority meeting schedule. Madam Chair, I will move to adopt the 2021 Regional Rail Authority meeting schedule. Motion made by Commissioner Dolan. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Now looking to set the next annual regional rail authority <clears throat> meeting. Madam Chair, I'm gonna get it right this time. We'll set the next annual regional rail authority meeting for January 4th, 2022. Make that motion. Motion yes. made by Commissioner Foby. When we've already approved the schedule, does it require a motion? Yeah, there's a kind of a format or structure that we follow yeah. with these. Yeah. Okay, seconded by Commissioner Barant. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. All right, now we will adjourn our Regional Rail Authority meeting and reconvene our regular meeting. So uh, as you transition though, I have to tell you, um, and this is for four of you, not for uh, our chair, but it, you know, it's common that clerks of the board typically bury one error in your packet just to see you know who reads <laughs> your packet so um, I will I will share with you that uh, your chairperson called yesterday and said I think that there's an error in the board packet and uh, I, I just wanted to note Keisha uh, was was very shy and in, in identifying it but we did have an error in one of the minutes and I think you did send out a corrected minutes did you not yes yeah, yeah. Got the yep. so I thought I thought that was kind of fun so <clears throat> thank you for uh, being so thorough in your preparations. <laughs> All right. That was supposed to not be a... <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we know what you were doing over the weekend, so yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, looking then to um, go on to awarding the bid for the 2021 official county publications, Diane. We finally have someone that. <laughs> and I do have a handout for you as well. Okay. Which I will give you first. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. How many years has it been, Diane, since we've had anybody that's actually had two to choose or more? Has it? Okay. Okay. So thank you. Before you is the, the request to award the bids for the 2021 official county publications. Uh, notices were sent out as required by um, state statute to put the publication in the paper for um, soliciting for bids for our 2021. And we received two bids. The handout that I presented to you, we received a bid from the Elk River Star News and one from the Patriot News Minnesota. <coughs> And in your packet, on the, um, there was the handout that I compiled everything together there. Um, 
as to which bids were for, for each newspaper, for each of the different categories. Uh, one thing I wanted to just give you a little bit of information on is the handout that I provided to you. It shows you the calculation and then the, um, the cost that it came down to for the lowercase alphabet. And on the back side of that where it's colored, I just do a 10 year um, running totals and stuff of the yearly costs of our publications for just those four. So that gives you just a little bit of an idea where things are kind of going. I know our delinquent tax list, like in 2010, because of the, the downfall and everything, we had so many, we had such a great big huge publication there. And as you can see, it's really fallen off over the years, you know, for the number that we actually have to do for publication. So which is good news for the county. So that's just some history and stuff for you and how the, the uh, bids were calculated. And so the following bids were received by 430 on December 23rd as requested from the newspapers um, listed for the following 2021 publications. And this was, the, was calculated based on the lower cost, uh, the lower case alphabet um, costs on there according to Minnesota National Minnesota Attorney's Legal Counsel formula that we have adopted many years ago. So we would want to do each publication independently. So the first one that I'm looking at to award is the delinquent tax list. On there we've got the Patriot uh, News Minnesota bid along with the Elk River Star News bid and the circulation is down below of the, each of those newspapers within Sherburne County. And they're both at $4 per inch. One has nine lines per inch and the other one has eight lines per inch. That's basically the difference on there. Diane, can you clarify for me, um, is the Elk River Star News, is that a subscription paper or is that a free paper that goes out? I know there is subscriptions for that, but I don't know if, if they deliver it to the residents. Barb, maybe you know better. Um, yeah, they... Um, I pay for it, but I don't know. Yeah, um, it's also available free. You can pick it up any, like at grocery stores and different places like that. So. Okay. It, you can subscribe, which I do, right. but you can also get it. Okay. Pick it up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I don't know as if it, it gets delivered like um, the Patriot News does, you know, oh. to all the residents around in that, those yeah, areas so. of the Clear Lake, Becker, I think part of Big Lake, that's the surrounding yeah, that, area. It gets mailed to their mail, to their either their mailbox or yeah. their P.O. box. Yep. Well, and that's every Friday. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, how, how does it work then? Okay, so we have to have an alternate publication. That's with the financial statements, yeah. That's just with the financial statements. Correct, correct. Yeah. So we're right now we're looking at the delinquent tax list for that publication for that one. And that's the first motion then, that we look for is to approve. We are looking for then a motion. To award, yeah. Award. To which paper? To the Patriot News or the Elk River Star News, the delinquent tax list publication. Madam Chair, I would move to um, adopt the delinquent tax list for 2021 to the Patriot News based on low bid. All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Dolan for the Patriot News based on the low bid for the delinquent tax list. I'll second that. And I have a second from Commissioner Schmeezing. Any further discussion on that? Madam Chair, and I should know this, but just to clarify for the public, this is by statute. We have to do this, correct? Correct, it is. Because both of these serve very little of my area of the county. Correct. Just wanted yeah. to make that statement. We have a challenge <laughs> here with these, and um, I know people can get it electronically, but... It's, it doesn't really serve my end of the county, so. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 
All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Okay, moving on to the financial statement. So this would be a request to award the uh, financial statement to either the two newspapers for that are submitted and bids for that um, based on, on the bids that are presented to you. And we're looking for a motion then to award the financial statement either to the Patriot News or the Elk River Star. Madam Chair, I'll move the awarding of the 2021 financial statement to the Patriot News based on low bid. Motion made by Commissioner Dolan. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the next one on there goes right down to the alternate publication financial statement and the awarding then to the op opposing or the other I'll, bidding. I'll motion the Star News. Motion made by Commissioner Foby. Or <laughs> schmeezing, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'll second. <laughs> second by Commissioner <laughs> Dolan. <laughs> I, got, I got, Lisa, you're on my brain, so <laughs> what can I say? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Okay, thank you. And then the next one would be awarding the um, publication for the commissioner proceedings. And the two bids are there presented before you. For the Patriot News, three seventy-five per inch and $4 per inch for the Elk River Star News. I'll motion to Patriot News based on low bid. Motion made by Commissioner Schmeezing. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Dolan. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, commissioners. I will be sending out um, the notice of awarding of the bids to both of the um, bidders and let our department heads know who our new legal newspaper will be for um, 2021. All right. Thank you, Diane. Right. Madam Chair, I just make sure you thank them that we've got bids from both of them and yes, how much we I do appreciate you know what they do we're kind of our hands are tied yeah. here we There's do have a representative here from the patriot news okay so okay i mean we we, we really appreciate both of our yes. newspapers so. yes okay thank you thank you you know we really are fortunate there are some counties now that are getting no mm -hmm. bids yeah and i think it's still in statute some of them have to turn to like the star tribune which is exceptionally expensive so that's uh uh, as you, if you recall, the discussion this year with AMC was seeing if we could work together with the Newspaper Association to modify that so that we address the new reality on the ground. Yeah. Well, that's been, uh, Madam Chair, that's been a point of discussion for a number of years now, and it just is, it's, it really has trouble getting any traction. I know, I believe the Stearns County uh, uses the Freeport News or, you know, that, and it's a real small newspaper with yeah. a very small circulation, but very cost effective for the county board. So, I mean, it's, there's, I think as time goes on, there's some issues to be worked out with how publications work in counties and government. You agree? Correct. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I guess the next item on the agenda was mine too. Thank you, Kathy, for right. doing that. I was off Moving on then to, um, for business. consideration and approval of the purchase and installation of additional driver's license, electronic signage, and related mobile ticket software. Diane. Yes, good morning. So we received um, a quote from Qmatic as to um, for the additional signage that we need to put up with our new build out and so forth. This we were not able to get um, covered by CARES funding due to the fact that the timing was much later than when we had to have everything spent by and so forth. Um, we are in the process tomorrow, we actually have a demo to look at the mobile ticketing piece of this. Um, uh, quote that we received and we wanted to put this all kind of together. It's actually a two piece one is for the signage and then the other piece is for the quote for the mobile ticketing and um, What the mobile ticketing will do is that people are, would be able to check in in the parking lot as they're here So they can they would get notification Right from their phones they could check in instead of coming in and to the kiosk and, and it just gives another step and another convenience to them that have that ability to do it. 
a lot of people, you know, still don't have that ability, so they still will come in. But this way, it affords them so they can kind of see, you know, how many minutes they've got to wait or whatever, if it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or whatever. And so then we can timely get those um, people checked in. So that's what that mobile ticketing is and what it's supposed to be doing. And Carmen, do you have any other additional information on it that you could provide? Or? Um, no, that sounds like we're going to get a demo today. Um, yeah, tomorrow, is it? Tomorrow, Carmen. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, so we'll know a little bit more, but um, basically maybe reducing some of the traffic up at the front desk with checking in because it would be right to their phone. They can check in instantly know where they're at with their line. So hopefully um, it'll have, it'll be paperless and there won't be a ticket that spit out of the machine or anyone just writing it. down their ticket number on, they're using sticky it's notes not. a lot of times right yeah. now, using sticky notes to hand out tickets to people. So it'll actually be like a mobile ticket right on their phone. So they know what number and then it'll text them when their number's up so they could walk around the building and know instantly, you know, that they're being called or they could wait in any area of the building and cancel. So that's what We're, so far we know about it. Yes. Okay. Oh, and I know Brian was supposed to be presenting as well and, and Michelle, she is in favor of it. Um, you know, if that would be uh, helpful for, you know, the front desk, I think it would with our volunteers and stuff, I think it would help minimize some of that traffic. They're still gonna get some, you know, cause they aren't gonna all have that capability or have the, uh, tools that we, they would be able to do the mobile check-in, but um, we think this will help a lot of people. All right. Um, yes, in reading through the information, um, I thought it was um, something that was going to advance our technology, mm -hmm. advance our ability to provide for the needs of the um, public and do it in a way that we're being progressive. So I thought, and we can also be using this when COVID and we finally are able to get back to some amount of normal, yes. this will still be a tool that mm -hmm. will yeah. be helpful to use. So I, yep. I think it's a great idea. So uh, just to let you know too, so I plan on taking the funding out of my budget as carryover dollars for this okay. specifically. So it's not gonna be increasing <coughs> the levy. I think it'll just be from the dollars that I do have on my budget to be able to carry over for this project in 2021. Okay, Commissioner Smeezing, did you have one? Well, just uh, this will be useful after uh, we survived COVID here, oh, so definitely. That, yes. we'll have value then. Yeah. Uh, using the carryover money, we we had been uh, capturing carryover money into a different account. Into a yes account. Into the yes account. Mm -hmm. So is that going through the yes account process to be returned back to? I mean, we don't. The reason we have a yes account account is we don't want. Uh, our departments to hurry up and spend reserves if they've, you know, if they've had a successful year. So, right. right. Um, I'm not sure, Diane, how you structured this one. Well, if it's this, going this one here, because it would be then an asset out of our, our department and Michelle's would be split this way. And she's using the recorder's technology I dollars for hers, her portion of it. So, um, I just assume put it right on the carryover that's carried over and designated for that piece. And that way it doesn't have to go through, it'd just be reduced from the yes account dollars that would go to the Yes, accounts. Okay, and I, you know, and that's fine. I, I don't have a problem with this, but I, I, I guess I don't want to see that become a widespread practice throughout this government center. I don't think that's a good way for us to manage our. Yeah. It just it would just shift it because it, the accounting would be your journal entry into the yes account. Then you have the journal entry back out into my department for me to pay for it. Hey. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I think we hear you. It probably if it wasn't the first meeting of the year, probably would have gone as a yes account withdrawal. Correct. But getting specific board authority here, if it's important, we can add that to the motion. The yes account provides another level yeah. of oversight yeah. that yep. is count, you know, county yeah. wide. Right? So yeah, in reality, you know, the anticipation of the action was taken last year. So I think, you know, probably it's close enough that Diane just said it's- Would have been regular budget any- Current year expenditure, okay. right? I, yeah. I'm not, I just- No, it's a good point. I, I it's a very good point. I don't want us to change our track. Yeah. That's good. So. That's good. It just would it mean double journal entries for us to do mm -hmm. to get to the same result. Any further discussion? If not, I would be looking for the motion to approve the attached code for purchase and installation of LED signage for the new driver's license windows and related software for mobile ticket 
not to exceed the amount of 8,262.33 based on the quotes provided. I'll make that motion, Madam Chair. Motion made by Commissioner Schmeezing. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you very much. Now, before Diane leaves, too, we should say that, you know, if, if you've not walked by there to see it, it's a pretty successful capital project to get that area up and running. Um, Diane and Carmen are putting together a, a discussion point for you, I think, at the next board next meeting board on staffing meeting. long term. Um, during that rush, if you remember pre COVID, mm. um, we had huge lines. Um, the, the appointment system is good, but Diane is expecting we're going to see an increase in demand again, especially as Correct. we get now closer to the next deadline for real ID. Yeah. Right. So we will look at some staffing scenarios for you and how to staff up that additional area. We have been cross training, but that's really a short term solution. So I don't know if you want to discuss that briefly, Diane, or just say that oh. it's in the works. Well, when what we're looking at is, you know, with the, the dollars that we do have in our current budget and for the, the dollars that are coming in to offset, I think the second care for the administrative, if I can use partial of those dollars, but we looked at um, how many uh, appointments that we would need, you know, per day for a staff person, you know, just to, to break even or to, um, to go over. So if we had 22 appointments for that one staff person, I believe the total cost of the salary and para and everything else and the FICA and Medicare would be um, a deficit of $8,000. Whereas if we went up to 25 for uh, appointments a day for that year time, it would be um, a profit of a thousand, thousand something. I didn't bring that paperwork with me. <laughs> but um, so we are doing those uh, scenarios to see where our break even point was. And we can, um, now we're able to look at the appointment schedule, tighten that up a little bit because we have, we're getting more consistent. And um, now if we get people consistent about canceling and we don't have these no-shows, that would be great too. Because then the minute that appointment's canceled, it pops up on the, the website that it's available and people have been snapping them up right away. Okay, great. So we've been trying to, you know, squeeze in people where we can and walk-ins we're taking, you know, we're trying to assist people wherever we can. Yeah. And then a couple other related thoughts that are, are we're, you know, going around a little bit. When you talk about legislative priorities, you can see why one of the legislative priorities we're recommending as staff is to increase the fee structure to support this infrastructure behind. And so Diane's association has been advocating to move from $8 per transaction to 24 uh, because, as you know, so many counties and private uh, driver's license bureaus lost money with the change to MinLars, and now I don't even know what it's called. Do you? Min Drive. Min Drive. So that's why you saw that on your legislative agenda uh, mm -hmm. as well, uh, just to be able to look at that as well long term. Diane, when was the last time that fees were increased for these services? Oh, gracious. I'm trying to think the year, if it was... Um... Just rough. 2008. And in that time frame, everything has gone it, up. Cost and, it, and it changed just by $2. Okay. It was from six to eight is what it did. It changed. And that was 2008 was the last time there was any change in that. But since then, I mean, we've taken over our staff and our, the deputy registrars have taken over the work and all the checking of the legal documents and stuff that the state used to do. Right. And now that we are, we are responsible for that. And then when we're not collecting enough to cover that service, it's Correct. going to fall to the taxpayers to pick up that difference. So. Correct. And that's a service that, I mean, that our taxpayers are telling us, I mean, that they're coming in, they're getting the service. They really like the appointment system. Yep. They like to be able to come in and, you know, it's just getting the appointment. It was taking so long. And you know, so we're reaching out. We must have, I think there's like over a weekend or whatever. When we come back on Monday, we probably got 200 calls on the call log that I've got yeah. a staff person that's coming in that's just handling all that. Yeah, well, I think it's helpful for us as uh, board members to know too so we can have conversations with um, the state and such in mm -hmm. pushing to make sure that they understand this is costing taxpayers um, for this service and it should be costing the people that are using the service. Mm -hmm. So, all right, and then um, 
Can you refresh our memory? When is the um, was the extension through? It was extended till October thirty first of this of year. October first, I believe. Or Octo Excuse me, October first of twenty twenty one. Okay, of this year then. Yes, so you're you're correct. There is going to be a huge. Push. Yes, there is because there are a lot of people that just they put it put it off. They decided not to do it or whatever. That they said, well, if I can get by with my standard right. right now and I don't have to do it. There's a lot of people that are putting off, but now we're finding out that there's some people that say, well, I can go on an expired license because we're during this emergency yeah. era. And, but then things are changing where they're having to all of a sudden, they're changing a job or they're getting you know, up something else. They need to have a valid driver's license and not an expired one. So then they're, they're coming in, they're trying to get their, all their uh, paperwork up to That's date. human nature. Procrastination is the name of the game, so. Yes. We All deal right. with that every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Anything further? Do that? All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for all you're doing and yep, working thanks. through getting us up to speed. What, what's that What's that word about technology? Work smarter, not harder? Along those lines. Okay. Moving on then to the consideration of the family's first Coronavirus Vi Virus Response Act. Benefit extension. Tammy. Good morning, Madam Chair, County Board of Commissioners. My agenda item today is seeking an extension of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, otherwise known as the FFCRA, <coughs> of the benefit. Uh, so as you probably have heard, um, the federal government did not extend the FFCRA paid benefits. So that was their emergency paid sick leave or an expanded FMLA. So what it was was paid leave if an employee was unable to work due to COVID-related reasons. It was in effect April 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2020. Employers have the option to voluntarily extend the FFCRA benefits. So uh, at this time, um, administration and HR recommend extending the deadline, um, moving that December 31st, 2020 deadline to February 28th, uh, 2021. Um, this would provide employees who have not already used their paid leave benefits, it gives them two more months. So just to be clear, it doesn't replenish or provide additional paid leave, it just gives them two more months if they qualify for the benefit. To date, countywide, we have 9% of our employees who use 80 hours, so 80 hours was the max for the um, emergency paid sick leave. We have 9% of our employees who utilized the 80 hours we have 23% that utilize some of the hours, but not all. I did just wanna mention, in case you heard in the news, that employers were offered a tax credit for the paid sick leave um, for the FFCRA, but public employers were exempt from that in 2020 and also in 2021. So I just wanted to mention that piece. And also, tax credit wouldn't help us anyway. no. <laughs> <laughs> if approved, also um, th the motion would also include that if for some reason the state or the federal government did again extend a paid leave benefit, we would rescind our county program and then rely on that state or uh, state or federal mandated benefit. All right. Any questions? Any questions for Tammy? No questions. I just appreciate this is so much for you to navigate and go through. So I just really appreciate the work on this for our employees. I think it's a great support for them. And um, I think it's the right thing to do. So I'll make that motion to approve the extension of the Families First Coronav Coronavirus Response Act as stated in the board agenda item. Motion made by Commissioner Foby. Seconded by Commissioner Brandt. Any further discussion? I think this is a good morale booster too. I think this is something that they understand we're supporting. These things are no fault of their own. So, all right. Hearing no further discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, Tammy. You're welcome. You get to see. You're the next again. item too. Yes. Considering the memorandum of understanding regarding related approval for additional paid COVID-19 leave for eligible county jail staff. Yes. Uh, so I have two memorandum of understandings with unions that I bring before you today seeking approval. 
and also approval for our non-union non jail recreation programmer employees, um, specifically looking for um, a jail COVID leave benefit. Um, no surprise to you all that working in the jail is a dangerous environment for employees, inmates, detainees. We have put in place very strict precautions and we continue to put that in place to keep it a safe environment. One of those precautions is that if an employee exhibits symptoms of COVID, they are not allowed in the jail. Um, and um, as you might be aware, jail staff also in most cases do not have remote work to do because their work involves being on site. So for that reason, we have many of our um, jail, jail staff who have used up that emergency paid sick leave that I just referenced. We have 29% of our jail staff that have used all their 80 hours, and we have 63% of our jail staff that have used some of their emergency paid sick leave. So in recognition of this unique situation, we would like to, um, we are seeking approval for a jail COVID-19 uh, leave for specific positions in the jail with specific requirements. Um, just to go through some of those specific requirements, the employee would need, the jail employee would need to test positive for COVID and they would need to provide documentation to HR of this positive test. There is no remote work available through the county. Um, in the event that there is remote work, we would reassign the jail staff employee to that work. Um, to be eligible for the jail COVID leave, the employee would have had to exhaust all their emergency paid sick leave. And then also, um, this is a one-time benefit. So in the event that an employee had already used this jail COVID benefit leave, they would um, not be eligible again. The specific jail COVID-19 leave we are proposing is up to 80 hours of paid leave if those specific requirements are met. Um, the additional paid leave would cover um, what MDH is now um, has uh, identified as a quarantine, which is 10 calendar days. And then employees who test positive uh, for COVID, if they're eligible for work comp, they would not be eligible for this benefit because the employee is already made whole through the work comp system. Uh, the proposed effective date of the jail COVID-19 uh, benefit is today, January 5th through June 30th, 2021 or until the county sheriff uh, determines the additional COVID-19 leave is unnecessary, whichever comes first. As you know, the landscape in COVID world is changing um, very quickly. Uh, so with that, um, I guess I will open up for any questions or concerns, comments regarding this request. Any questions for Tammy? Or yeah, I was just wondering if the requirement is that they test positive for COVID and sometimes after you get the test, it's a few days before you find the results. How do you manage that waiting? You know, if they have symptoms or even if they don't have symptoms. Uh, if, I'm just a little concerned about the wait. So once we would receive that positive test result, if the employee had been out, let's say for two days before receiving, we would retro back and provide that because oh. that time off would be associated with the positive test results. Okay. okay. And we, we do recognize that there is that delay in getting the test results for employees. Madam Chair? Yes. And the MOUs have been approved by the uh, members, memberships? Yes, sir. Both both so, groups have informed us that the memberships have voted to accept the agreement. So the county board uh, approves this today. It will move forward. Yes. All right. Any further questions? If not, then I'd be looking for that motion to approve the memorandum of understanding with the MMPEA corrections officers and master control operators and Te Teamsters correction supervisory unit regarding additional paid COVID-19 leave and also approve the additional paid COVID-19 leave for jail recreation programmers. I'll move approval. Motion made by Commissioner Foby and seconded by Commissioner Barant. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you. Great. Moving on to approving our 2021 meeting schedule for the County Board of Commissioners. Bruce. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. Uh, the meeting schedule per se, I think, is pretty much what you would expect it to be year to year, which is the uh, meetings of the regular meetings of the county board would be uh, the, what do we say, the first and the third, with the uh, one exception being July. Am I getting that right, Keisha? Yeah. Um, so uh, otherwise, the calendar is pretty much set. Uh, we do have a sub item, uh, perhaps once there's a motion in a second to accept the schedule, then we we didn't put on the agenda a formal review of your operating procedures simply because there weren't any questions this year, but I did have a couple of things I wanted to raise on that. Keisha, do you want to add anything more on the proposed schedule, though, itself, other than the deviations from the norm? Um, just that we tried to base it off of the way we have in the past, which is a more difficult this year with COVID coming into play, so we don't know how the conferences are going to play. So we're basing it all off of the first and the third and not necessarily around when the conferences are because they're not released. Okay. All right. Any further questions? I'll move the schedule. Yeah. Motion made by Commissioner Schmeezy. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Bruce, um, just to discuss um, some um, policy um, amendments, possibilities. Bruce, do you want to take it? Sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. A, a couple of things uh, with respect to uh, uh, committees or um, conferences, uh, I'll defer to those of you serving on AMCs and MICA's boards, but I will share with you at least generally from what I'm hearing is most conferences are deferring in person at least through the half, first half of this year. Um, there are a couple of conferences that they're tentatively scheduling for in person in September and October, but basically anything through June they're assuming will either be deferred or remote, um, at least at this point. Uh, the second issue is um, in your uh, administrative policy manual under operating procedures, there's a policy called operating procedures for the board. It does call for it to be reviewed every year at the statutory meeting, which is this meeting. Um, staff didn't have any recommendations per modifying it, but we just wanted to make sure that the board at least was aware. The operating procedures say things like Robert's Rules of Order is used and sets up the order of schedule for how meetings are conducted. Um, the one thing that did come up uh, last year, uh, there was some discussion, if you remember, by the board uh, fairly early on in the year, and you adopted a procedure to handle requests for um, what I'll call highly partisan or political issues that were not within the county's wheelhouse. So the ones that we dealt with before were a request for sanctuary city or sanctuary county, and then there was one regarding um, uh, being a, a freedom county or constitutional county. And now recently there's been one uh, talking about being a, a more of a business friendly county. Uh, the county board adopted a procedure back then, which was generally speaking, the board didn't entertain those here. You received comments, um, you received letters, and then on behalf of the board, your administrator would, would review it uh, and then typically send a response saying, unless it deals with county policy, county mandated statutes, or county budgets, uh, typically we don't uh, have comments on those. Um, Stearns County actually did the same thing. Uh, they, a little different though, they put it in a formal resolution. So one of the options might be if the county board is interested is I could modify the procedure we have in place now and make it as part of your formal policy. It would probably fall under that operating procedures policy somewhere in the types of board actions. Uh, and I would use the Stearns County resolution because it's in greater detail as the model. Uh, but I wanted to get the board's thoughts on that first before I did that and then uh, probably bring it back on the 19th. Any thoughts for Bruce on this? Or I, I think that sounds us. like a good idea to put it into our policy uh, and to use that as our template. Anybody else? Well, Madam Chair, I, yeah, I think it's very clear that we need to uh, be clear on our position with that. And I think it's also important for people to recognize that we, uh, we can pass resolutions that were business friendly and still be terribly unfriendly to business. So I would hope that uh, you know, the actions of this board is how we're judged, not by some resolution that we may or may not take up. Yep, I agree. Madam Chair. Commissioner Dolan. 
Yeah, I would say putting this into policy makes sense. We've been practicing it now ever since I've been on the board. So I think memorializing it in policy and, and making sure it's clearly articulated and the public understands yes. where we're at with that is a sound decision. Yeah. Any further discussion? If not, then it sounds like by consensus we would be um, asking um, staff then to bring something back in that policy thought. Yeah, I think if you're okay, I'll just uh, generate it and uh, and I'll send it out for comment. I'll probably use the Stearns, I hate to give credit to Stearns County too many times, especially because Mike's up there, but um, <laughs> they did a really good job. I mean, even better than the, the operating guidelines we put together. So I'll probably use that because it spells it out. I like this language. Um, basically, unless it has a, a direct, unambiguous and explicit relationship to the county's program services, policies or budgets, we don't deal with it kind of thing. So it's pretty clear. So, um, so I, yeah, I'll put that together. Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Yes, yeah, Stearns County has done a lot of work on this, giving a little more credit to Mike at AMC Futures. This is a topic we're taking on in our February meeting, and Mike is going to present. So um, I think this is very appropriate, and I would expect that anyone that uh, contacts any of us that Bruce could just send out a link to that or a copy of that to mm -hmm. them. So we're very clear. Um, I think that would be helpful with the work that we intend to be about. Very clear and consistent. I think that's important. All right, I'll get that ready then. Um, other than that, there were no other operating procedures that we identified uh, unless the commissioners have things you want us to look at as well. Just a, a clear point of clarity, Robert's rules of order is a guide for this board, not the, uh, we don't, yes. aren't tied tightly to them. Okay. I'm not aware of too many bodies of government at the local levels that are tied really tight to, it's just kind of like a guideline. Yeah, and, and some, are, some use phrases like as modified by local practice or as you said, a guide. Uh, and on that note, uh, you know, I think when it comes to agenda setting, uh, the, at least since I've been here, typically the board chair and the administrator work pretty closely, but your policy says any commissioner can ask for an item to be put on the agenda, but it also says more time is better so that the board's aware of it coming and then staff can prepare materials. So, um, you know, it really is a very iterative process, I think, just to make sure things work well. All right, any further discussion on policy? Hearing none, okay, we'll move on then to the next item, is our consideration of the 2021 legislative priorities. Bruce. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Uh, this is, I think, your fourth time looking at this. Uh, I don't know if you're comfortable enough to uh, formally ratify uh, for Thursday, but if you're not, we'll just present it as draft. Um, the one change in the draft from when you saw this last time is uh, pursuant to your conversation, I did move up. Uh, Keisha, can you go to the attachment there? Uh, thank you. Uh, what I did do is, based upon your conversation, I did move up uh, a total of five uh, priority items, but really, in effect, it's three in which the county is the lead, and two that the board could designate as being high priority, but other uh, groups taking primary lead. Uh, so that was the one significant change from the last board meeting. Uh, and I'll go over those in a little bit of detail here in a second. The second change uh, was uh, based upon feedback from the commissioners. I also changed that the two high priority projects, and those are support rural broadband funding and access and uh, compensating deputy registrars for lost business and increased costs. Both of those, while other organizations will take the lead, um, at least a couple of commissioners felt it important enough that we highlight that those are so important to Sherburne County that we will be active with those organizations. So not just passive, like, yeah, we support it, but actually uh, offering to be, uh, in essence, really proactive is what I should say. So you'll notice slash county on those two items. Um, with uh, the exception of those changes, really the three priorities that the county spoke about or the board did was uh, construction funding for Trunk Highway 169, CASA 4 interchange. 
I want to note on that one, that one will be of particular discussion on Thursday because at least one of our representatives, Representative Novotny, has expressed pretty strong interest in moving ahead the construction schedule. Um, and Andrew is aware of this, and that's something he's going to have to work with MnDOT on because the logic that we were using is we'll just kind of go boom, boom, boom through Elk River and then boom in Zimmerman. And Novotny said, nah, let's rip the bandit off and get her done. I don't know where Representative Doubt is on that conversation. I've not spoken with him, and I don't know uh, honestly where Representative or Commissioner Phobia is on that. But I do think, since that is our number one priority, um, we should probably get our ducks in a row whether or not we want to advocate for a sooner construction versus a more, more paced one. And Andrew can help with that, knowing how MnDOT may or may not respond to that, or Davis here too. So. Um, we could discuss that in, in a second in greater detail. Um, the second item is to work on health and human service response flexibility with Amanda. Um, this is one that uh, Senator Ralph had introduced for us and was scheduled for a hearing. It had a companion bill in the House, uh, and sadly, uh, with COVID, of course, things got put on hold. Uh, Amanda will be doing some pulse checking here in the next several weeks if the board continues to advocate for this. One, we want to make sure that the state associations are still on board. And then two is we will have to find a new sponsor in the Senate and, and work on that a little bit. Uh, and then the third county specific one is uh, a discussion point which Dan can talk about briefly here. And that is looking at whether or not we want to advocate for changes in our uh, economic development world in our authority. And as of now, that uh, could be considered a high priority or it could be something that we just put a placeholder down and work over several months. Um, and then uh, and then we'll touch base real quickly on broadband and Diane's here again to talk about the fee structure if you wanna go into greater detail. Did you wanna start or do you wanna start with Andrew first? It's your oh, call. We can start with Andrew, sorry. No, no, that's right. If you got things to do, you go first. So. <laughs> but you gotta do broadband as well, so. Okay. All right. I, I just wanna give a little background on the Community Development Agency. When this was first brought up last year, it was our intention to go over it through the strategic priority meetings that we were having with commissioners, that this would be built into that to figure out how we wanna move forward with a CDA. Essentially, it combines our EDA and our HRA and allows us to draft programs through legislation that the county can implement and administer. And, and Kathy or Tim, correct me if I'm wrong. My intent was to get board approval to move forward with that last year and then work with the townships and cities to make sure they were on board with us being a community development agency because it would give us authority to operate within their jurisdictions. So because of COVID, CARES kind of became my full-time job and we never really got to proceed with that discussion. So I'm not sure we're at the point yet where we would draft legislation, but I wanted feedback from you on, on how you feel about combining those organizations and, and what type of programs we want to administer as a county moving forward. And, and Tim, did I, did I miss anything or misstate anything? We, we can get you your own mic, Tim, you know. So. <laughs> you know how I feel about that. Um, no, it, it, some of the, over the years we've met with some of the um, CDAs that have been formed, Dakota, um, Washington, and so on. And a lot of what a CDA is, it's just a combination of your EDA and your HRA. So it, it doesn't necessarily give you more powers than you have now unless you write in in a special legislation specifically what you want to do. Just as an example, Washington, I think Dakota County got into some um, senior housing projects and had authority to issue tax credits for it. So part of the background work we've started, um, you know, we've, we've hired out a uh, housing study um, to look at what needs to be done. Um, but I'll, when we get to the point of if this is where you want to go, when we get to the point of writing legislation to form the CDA, I think it's really important for the board to identify what projects we want to do. Do we want to get into more housing? Um, do we want to coordinate with local HRAs? Uh, do we want to take over those jurisdictions? Or, or do cities want us to do that? Um, those types of discussions. I think that's what Stan's talking about is We've identified we want to be more active. Okay, so now specifically, what do we want to do? All right. Yeah, sure. Mr. Species. 
Do, so, some of these uh, taxing authority, how does that, I'm racing to the bottom line here. Uh, you know, I, I, there's a lot of cooperation that can be done between the two, and I think that all works. But at some point, you'll have to discuss how it will be funded and Correct. who will be the funders of it. Currently, we're, we're funding economic development through the general levy, so there'd be a transition to that to potentially its own taxing authority. I don't think it would have to be done that way. You could draft the legislation either way where the county board would still have authority over the budget, but that is something that would be discussed as we move forward. That's why I'm not exactly sure we're at the point where we go seek legislation yet, but I, I, I think it's something we want to move towards as a goal for the very near future. I, and, I, and I agree with that. I agree with moving forward, but I think we also, you know, we all need to understand what that might mean, and it might mean another level of taxation, and that will be a big discussion for us and our constituents. Madam Chair. Yes. Mr. Dolan. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I believe our EDA and HRA have taxing authority already. We just don't exercise. They do. We choose not to, yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's not, we're not creating an additional opportunity for taxing. It's just a different vehicle for the same authority that we already have. It's just bringing it all under one umbrella. Basically, it is, and, and then it allows us, like Mr. Sime mentioned, that we could draft special programs that, that would grant the county authority to, to administer these throughout the county. I, I agree. I don't think we're to the point of legislation yet, but I think we definitely need to get this um, figured out and worked out because, in my opinion, um, economic development without a uh, focus on housing as well is kind of like you're not, con you're not completing the whole circle. You need to have that housing, and it's been very, um, very much apparent through the county as we continue to grow. Um, the housing needs in our county are are large, for across the board. So I'd like to see us get more um, into the EDA and the housing under one umbrella to have that discussion and moving in a process that is going to make sense while we're connecting the dots. Perhaps as a next step, we could discuss it, this at the EDA meeting on the 28th and form a committee to yeah. start exploring options and, and really drive it in the direction everybody wants it to go. Yeah. We could get feedback and then come back perhaps next year or the year after and, and get the legislation completed. Yeah, because you, you can bring in all the economic development you want if you don't have housing for the workforce. It's, it's going to struggle. So um, I think this is a good, a good plan to start going down that road. So a couple quick thoughts on your conversation. One is uh, it also may play into broadband. Um, if the county wants to make a local priority of broadband versus just waiting for more state or federal funds, this could be the vehicle to do it. Uh, Dan laid out you know, one of two options, and, and I'll defer to Commissioner Foby here with her past experience to help me. Uh, one option would be to leave it as a legislative priority to elevate the conversation um, and theoretically, we have until probably, it sounds like the committee deadlines are going to be end of March, Lisa. So we could theoretically even put a placeholder bill in by early March. Doesn't mean we don't continue to amend it and modify it, craft it. And it, the benefit of doing it this legislative cycle is even if we don't pass it this legislative cycle, it's still an active bill for next year, even though it'll be a bonding bill next year. If we wait to do a bill introduction next year, it's much more difficult so as Dan said, we could also just start the work here locally. Don't worry about the legislative issues at all. But realistically, we're putting it off for a couple of years. So depending on the board's comfort, we could put some effort into this over January and February, keep it on our legislative priority list, and then make that final decision in early March. Um, it doesn't work perfectly for Dan's calendar because he'll be working a lot on, on the uh, CARES Act funding. But if we keep it strategic and high level, I don't know how your comfort level is with at least exploring it further. Otherwise, we could remove it from the legislative priority list and just make it a strategic initiative for the county. But then again, like you said, sometimes getting a thought process in front of the legislators yep. the first round, you get that year out of the way then that you're probably not going to get anything. Yeah, and there's risk reward. I mean, the, 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 the reward is we may find everything falls into place and this is the year to do it. Um, the risk is somebody might think we got the cart before the horse and you might get some townships a little bit, you know, hey, what are you doing? And we, we haven't laid out a, you know, nine-month process to get there. 
um, realistically, the legislative session is two years. So again, you know, my, my gut reaction is put a bill in, get it introduced, see what happens. You can always slow it, you can amend it, but that's me. I'm, and I don't want to risk the county if you feel otherwise or burn Dan out if it's all going to hit in the next two months. So we'd have to pace ourselves and manage it. Yeah. And I don't foresee us moving in a way that we are going to overpower our townships. That's never been our thought process. We've always been very good about working with them. This, I think, just allows us the opportunity to combine two. I mean, it's one of the things that's kind of frustrating is we convene our housing and redevelopment authority meeting just to say, okay, we're going to meet again in a year. I know. Um, Madam I Chair, um, I, I think it's good to leave it on as a priority this year with the thought process that Bruce shared. I think the conversations need to happen. I do think we need to be highly sensitive to how we bring our partners in the county into those conversations sooner than later. Um, so it does work well for us and, and we include them in some ownership in this. It's something that's been a priority for us since I took the oath four years ago, the housing issue. We keep talking about it, but doing no, not a lot on it. So I, I think it's great, and I do think it's going to be a, a somewhat heavy lift legislation-wise. So I think to start those conversations with our legislators is important. Okay. Madam Chair. Commissioner Dolan. And, and just a point of clarification, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but we already have EDA and HRA authority in all of our townships. The only places we don't have HRA or EDA authority would be within a city that has their own established EDA and HRA already. So really, again, to state the fact, this is just a different vehicle to do much of the same that we're already doing. So the sale to the townships shouldn't, shouldn't be any monstrosity. It's just really almost status quo for them. The cities are the ones that will probably ultimately be more impacted and have more insight into it. And I think as a county, we need to be working with our cities as well. Mm -hmm. um, this is a lot of things that get put on cities to provide without a lot of resources either. So, and, but it benefits the whole county as well. So I think it's important that we um, consider that as well, that we are working partners with our cities and our county also. Commissioner sure. Bobby? Sure. I agree. I think we definitely have to have be having conversations with our cities. What I'm finding up in my end of the world is um, annexation is happening for multi-unit housing. That's really great. That's really critical. Um, it's happening right now both in Princeton and Zimmerman. So to keep a finger on that pulse of what's going on and have them as part of the conversation, I think is important. Okay. Madam Chair, when you begin to Easy. when you begin to tie it all together and you put uh, rural broadband access in that under that uh, the sale becomes much easier. Uh, mm -hmm. Everyone is, everyone is thinking about what kind of uh, internet coverage they have at this point. So uh, I, I think you know, I think it's very worthy of our discussion as well. And I think it's also timely as well because I'm hearing that out of the federal level, we all know that CARES has um, shined a big, broad spotlight on the um, big holes that we have in our rural broadband. Um, abilities and I'm hearing that they're looking to put some more funding and I would like us to be ahead of that curve and ready to to go when there's something that comes up so I think this makes sense uh, before we switch to broadband then and Dan can just give you a, a real quick update on that um, I would note I, I, I don't want to under emphasize the importance though of of that first conversation with uh, the townships and the cities. And uh, we may actually ask and have you, you know, put you guys to work with that just simply because it's a resource issue with staffing. I mean, we can put together the materials and the talking points, but at the end of the day, this this will probably be a, a lift that each of you are gonna have to help us with. Um, if it's if it's staff to staff, it's one thing, but it's gonna, be, it's gonna have that conversation, that leadership conversation. Oh. Well, and I think, too, it kind of speaks for itself that um, there are some townships in our county that just aren't at that level of development yet, and they're going to be, nothing's going to change for them, really. It's going to be more, we're going to be um, helping assist in the development of the areas that are already doing it. They just, 
we can use we can have some involvement and assistance with it. So we're not looking to do anything different. Just looking to coordinate the efforts. All right. With uh, respect to the support increase rural broadband, Dan, did you want to add anything more? Just what you're hearing at the state level and efforts, and then we can talk to the board about uh, Wednesday's uh, conversation with the federal level. Yeah, every year this broadband becomes a discussion, so we'd really like to build broadband funding into the base budget, so it's not something we have to every year make a priority. We, we hope it's in the base budget and that funding carries over from year to year, so that's one thing we'll definitely ask for. And then our last study was done in 2015, so I'm actually working with a few consultants to get some updated costs on what it would take to update our plan and really dive deeper into what that report gave us five years ago. And uh, I'm looking to have a workshop on the 19th to discuss broadband a little deeper. But as, as far as Thursday's meeting, you know, our, our big ask will be to keep border-to-border -border pro projects going, grant projects going, to fund it at a higher level and to build it into the base budget. So it's not something we have to keep allocating resources to advocate for every year. Yeah, to, to me it's no different than Planning roads and bridges. We need to be planning our broadband. And then with respect to that, uh, Wednesday afternoon, we do have a conference call scheduled with our federal lobbyist to discuss uh, federal broadband grants. Uh, and depending on the outcome of that call, um, we'll bring back some thoughts to you on the 19th as well. It may be ripe for us actually to put in for a federal, uh, it's actually a CARES Act grant for broadband at the federal EDA level. So I. Uh, with the board's permission, I was going to ask if uh, the chair and maybe Commissioner Dolan might join us on that call, just because I know you've been uh, tracking that pretty closely. Definitely. Okay. All right. Well. Thank you, Dan. Okay, Andrew. So you can chide Dan later for jumping in front of you there. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so item number one on the priority list is uh, Trunk Highway 169 in the Casa Four, and, and Andrew can give you his thoughts and feel on on how we proceed. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, County Board members. Um, I guess I don't have a whole lot to add here. I mean, I mean, you guys have seen this before. We were successful in getting the design funds, uh, which we're working very actively right now with MnDOT on, and trying to work through the legislation and, and um, getting the necessary documents in place so that we can begin that process. Um, as engineers, when we talk about projects of this magnitude going quickly, we're still talking in a matter of years. Uh, I know there's some interest in accelerating that as quickly as we can. I'm going to work over the next couple of days to try to put together a very rough schedule to see what kind of the quickest timeline can be. So, you know, maybe simply stated with this legislative priority for us, um, it's not a difficult one from the perspective of we're not looking to change any sort of statutory language, any law changes, any organizational changes, things like that. It is difficult, though, because we're asking for a very large chunk of money to help with the construction, as well as the conversation about what that timeline looks like. And although it might not seem like it on, on the surface, those two are very interrelated. Start talking about accelerated schedules, design build type projects, alternative uh, delivery methods, all of a sudden the costs start going up. You start talking about um, quicker delivery schedules and we start looking at more of an eminent domain process in order to get control of that property. Costs go up. It doesn't give us the time to negotiate and work through those aspects that we really might need to. Um, again, quickening that schedule also makes a little more difficult of a conversation with some of our project partners, maybe specifically MnDOT, as far as getting it into their pipeline. Um, if this is a local initiative that's important, which we all know it is, um, then we need to assume some of those roles and responsibilities that maybe traditionally MnDOT would accept and, and take on. We'll still work with them to get them into those roles and responsibilities, but given their, their five-year and 10-year plans, um, we may need to step up and accept some of those, some of those items. So um, with that, I guess I'm, I'll open it for discussion and answer any questions and, and you know, hear any direction that we might have in regards to this. Andrew, when you say about the five-year, 10-year plan and maybe having to take on some of those responsibilities, would that be temporary until MnDOT would, I mean, would it be like um, borrowing into it? 
um, or would we be not reimbursed at some point for anything that NINDOT would have possibly contributed? It, it could be, Madam Chair, County Board members, it could be anything from, um, which we've already done to some extent, accepted responsibility for design, which NINDOT may have normally have done, um, you know, property acquisition. If you start thinking about the corridors of commerce project down in Elk River right now, Minot's taking the lead on property acquisition. We may end up having to do that just because they don't have the resources and they've got other priorities within their district that they're working on. Okay. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Andrew? <coughs> Andrew uh, I, I'm just curious uh, what our track is on North Star. I see we have it down as a priority for expansion. Uh, you know, it's, I think this board needs to discuss at some point where we're at. And I don't know how this interplays. I know we probably will have some state legislators that will be uh, seeking funds for expansion. How do we, I think that's a pretty delicate subject for us at this point, so. Correct, if I may respond, Madam Chair, uh, county board members. You know, when you see it on the screen in summary like that, it doesn't provide the detail that I think you're you're getting to, Commissioner Schmeezing. Probably. Um, I, I know that in years past, our legislative initiatives in regards to North Star has been when appropriate and when feasible. Um, obviously, when we were having this conversation a year ago, things were much, much different. So we'll need to continue those conversations and see what that looks like potentially moving forward as things evolve over the next six months to a year and I and I can I can live with that I mean I think it just needs to be understood when when appropriate and, and when, when feasible, feasible. Yeah. madam chair I back to the North Star piece I would even like the language changed a little bit on here um, how would you like it to read to reflect no, that absolutely. yeah that's fine we'll just yeah. I was thinking we'd just add that when appropriate and feasible yeah okay. when appropriate and feasible or even leave that off so it just says improve Trunk Highway 10 and I-94 connectivity, mobility, and safety. I, I so I would, either way, I would concur with that if yeah. that would be acceptable. Then I think yeah, because if there's actually any money no. that's available for North Star, it needs to go into supporting the deficit at the moment of no riders. So sure. we'll just remove including expansion North Star commuter rail. Mr. Uh, Foby, just want to circle back to the 169 and for interchange, uh, Dave Riddell and I were out at Zimmerman City Council meeting last night mm -hmm. because we've worked in partnership with them on a corridor study that has just rolled, we're done with now, so we have all that information. This interchange was discussed quite a bit, off and on, and they would like it done sooner than later, and they're going to advocate and push for that. So um, it also might affect some of the changes with the corridor, the outcome of the corridor, the recommendations of the corridor study. So we're kind of um, doing a little chicken and egg up there right now with this piece. Um, so I would love or encourage us to see that expedited schedule um, when you get that put together. If that will be a reality, you know, who knows? Um, but I uh, would like to also reach out to Representative Doubt and Representative Novotny, just have conversations with them. So, and I plan to do that. All right. Madam Chair. Mr. Dolan. Uh, that kind of hits on one of my questions on that priority. And it's Commissioner Phoebe's district, so I don't have quite, I'm not quite as in tune up there. But when we talk about being more aggressive with this, is, is there kind of a general consensus locally as far as how this thing is going to be aligned and everything like that? We talk about Elk River, and it was that was pretty cut and dry as, as far as how things could go. This historically has had some controversy surrounding its alignment and where things are going. So I just don't want to push and put a bunch of horsepower and then run into a big local guffaw about where things are going. Right, Madam Chair, Commissioners, if I may add a little detail to that. So we've been we've been having those conversations specifically with the city. There does seem to be strong interest in moving forward. Um, there seems to be strong interest in revisiting what that um, 
I don't even want to call it a recommended interchange that came out of the environmental assessment looks like or what it could look like. Again, we know more now than we did back then. Um, we've got some different tools in the toolbox that I think we can take advantage of, and I know the city has expressed um, willingness and interest to take a look at those moving forward. So that's everything that we'll flesh out in the in the design that we got the $2 million from the state from over the course of the next year, year and a half. Okay. Okay. Have you been hearing the same thing, Commissioner Foby? Um, I think it's very important that we communicate with both staff and the electeds mm -hmm. and over communicate and all that, all the conversations that are happening. Because sure. I will at times hear different <clears throat> things depending on who I'm talking to. So, um, yeah, I think it would be uh, important for us to really do some work in communicating actively and often as we move forward with both those pieces, the corridor study and the interchange. And are you suggesting like some workshop opportunities with, uh, with everybody involved? Because sometimes to communicate separately, it's easier to get them all in one room so they're hearing the same thing at the same time and you're hearing from them the same thing. Yeah, I don't know exactly what that all looks like, but we are, Dave and I and Andrew have been talking in also with Zimmerman city staff and the elected, so right. on how that needs to happen. But it was good for us to all be at the meeting last night with their staff and um, most of, some of their staff, I should mm -hmm. say, and uh, their city council, so. Um, just to circle back, did you get enough clarification, Bruce, on what the discussion for um, the um, rural broadband, was it the broadband or, no, the North Star? Was uh, the well, you had two things I didn't, I was going to ask which where the consensus is. One was to add the words when and where appropriate, and then the other one was just to delete the reference completely. So uh, look for the board's thoughts on that. You want to give Bruce Or at least his language of just remove the reference completely. Okay, no objections? Okay, uh, that was it. Uh, so, Andrew, thank you. Uh, last, uh, well, next to last, uh, Amanda can talk a little bit about uh, the response flexibility and uh, just to, since you, you know about this topic already, you kind of just maybe briefly summarize it and why we still think it's important. Hi, good morning, commissioners. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add uh, new on this. This is um, a very similar uh, but somewhat expanded uh, legislative priorities uh, statement from last year. You'll know that um, there's 24-hour response time uh, when there's uh, imminent danger or child sexual or alleged child sexual con uh, uh, contact. And um, we have uh, asked for supervisory override on those. Sometimes the child will be at summer camp. Um, oftentimes the allegation is old um, from quite a few years back and then we still are uh, adhering to that 24 hour requirement. Sometimes the um, child is with uh, a, a custodial parent who we know is safe. Um, and then in all other uh, circumstances outside of that imminent danger and um, uh, alleged sexual contact, there's a five day, again, asking for supervisory override in those instances where we know a child is safe. Um, so uh, MAXA has this on their 2021 uh, legislative priorities. Uh, it's not their top priority, but it is on there. Um, as uh, Administrator Messalt had uh, indicated that Senator Ralph was a author last year and then with COVID, uh, unfortunately did not get a hearing. And so hopeful that um, we're still in support of this and uh, we can work on finding a, an author to um, it had a, a lot of bipartisan traction in um, both the House and Senate last year. Any other questions for Amanda? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And then we've already heard from Diane on the increase of the fee, but if you have any other questions on that priority project, we could touch base on that as well. And that's the one we probably won't take the lead, but we'll be actively endorsing it. Well, and I think we should be strongly actively when you see the cost that is falling to the taxpayers to provide that service, it becomes pretty apparent that it's long overdue. Yeah, and if if we see traction on that particular item, uh, Diane and I have also noodled around maybe some flexibility that we could even try a contactless um, uh, 
tab vending machine. We did talk to a vendor who's a Minnesotan uh, company that actually provides them in Wisconsin, where you go up to a vending machine, you put in your information, you get your tabs. It's very efficient, uh, but in that particular case, uh, the surcharge is passed on to the customer. In Minnesota's case, that statute doesn't allow it. So what that means is, is that somebody has to eat that cost. So um, if we see this bill go forward, we may even modify it to allow some flexibility on those types of opportunities down the road. That's actually an area where we don't have a personal interest because we, of course, don't do the tabs, but it might be an interesting opportunity to create a pilot case where we could have a vending machine. People walk in, all they have to do is renew their tabs. They you know, type in the insurance information they need. Boom, hit the, hit the credit card, and out comes the tabs. So it's, it's not new technology. It's just not new, to, or it's not used in Minnesota. May I ask you that that piece also is on the uh, MACO legislative okay. priority list. It's down the list, but it is on there as well. Yeah. I got a feeling we're going to get some pushback when anything is at $8 and we're wanting to push it to 24 That's the problem with not keeping up with costs is all of a sudden your jump is so huge that most people wouldn't even recognize it, but... I think, right. I think the registrars would accept... 10 or 12, just to see some change, yes. but yes, we, we hear you. Yes, I think that offers some room to negotiate. Yes. So, start yeah. high. Yeah. <laughs> and on both ends of that, they are taxpayers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, right. Whether, we whether they're buying anything. their license or rather they're uh, paying the... Paying the employees, yeah, who are being subsidized. Yeah. Yeah. They are all our taxpayers. It's all so. coming from taxpayers. Right. So absent uh, any other changes would make these changes and then uh, if the board wants to adopt this as their legislative priorities of course it can be amended any time during the year but we can take the word draft off for uh, Thursday and then uh, again the intent would be staff would present on these five items Thursday uh, very briefly. Uh, the first order business will be to uh, after introductions will be though to thank the state representatives for last year. It was very successful for Sherburne County. And then a little different this year, I recommend giving them each a few minutes to give their thoughts as the session starts for them. Uh, we may have some coming in by WebEx Plan. simply because um, the mail. of the, of the, you know, the, I'm on Sunday. what's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we may be here three hours, I know. Uh, but, but anyhow, then, and then turn to these five. So I'll have this as a handout, but when instead of all staff actively participating, staff will be observing, monitoring, and then again, Amanda, Dan, uh, Diane, if she's available, and, uh, and Andrew will be here to present on the items then. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, Bruce, to definitely recognize the work from last year, yep. regardless on how they voted. Yep. Keisha, can you scroll back to the top, please? All right, so then we're looking at these top 2021 legislative, legislative priorities. We're going to be removing the um, reference to North reference Star. Reference to the North Star. So that will then be four. So do we see any, how do we want to see this presented to them? I know we had made that little booklet or whatever that we did last year. Yeah, we won't have that ready for Thursday. What I thought I would do is get this in a nice, you know, just a handout. Yep. And then we will start preparing uh, what I heard from the board is one page uh, leave behinds on the top three items. So it'll just be a single leave behind. Andrew had a nice postcard last year mm -hmm. that we did, and we've started looking at updating that. Uh, so whether it's a one page, half page, quarter page, we'll figure that out. But yeah, go with a different format. We, we we probably don't need a booklet as much as just this will be the platform of the county and then three leave behinds. Okay. That sound good to everybody? Nope. Yeah, that sounds great. None of these are new. So I've heard, I don't think any of these are brand new this year. No. A lot of it's carryover. Yeah. The, well, there's some new things for us in the platform, but not in the high priority. Uh, Parks and Rec is new. Uh, this represents oh, yeah. Andrew's growth. Uh, not in our priorities. Correct, all. correct. And then also, I, I did note Veteran Services last year was successful. They don't really have an initiative. The organization will, but none, none that Bruce flagged for you. So, yeah. yeah, it is iterative. I congratulated Bruce on that. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right, any further discussion then on our legislative 2021 um, priorities? If not, I'd be looking for that motion to approve them as amended. So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Dolan. Seconded by Commissioner Barant. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Okay. Moving. Uh, item seven is the committee assignments. Yep. And if you want, Keisha can just briefly update you on what changed since you saw this last. Keisha. So the only changes are made is what we basically discussed in the board meeting workshop. And the changes are highlighted in yellow. I did have one question on the extension committee. We had Barb down, but we also need a second person. And I did not have note of a second person for extension. And um, for the MICA, for notes from 2020 or from 2019 into 2020, we had Tim down for 2021. I could do the, I know I see I'm on 2022 for the um, extension committee. Yep. It probably would be a good idea to have a learning curve. Um, I can do that if it, anybody else, unless someone else wants it. And then the other one was what, Keisha? Uh, Micah. Micah. Okay. Now, with Micah, I can leave Micah. I'm on the ballot this year, but. Uh, I was just wondering, because it was a note that was carried over from when we established the 2020 yeah. committee assignment. So I didn't know if we wanted to go back to that. Well, Tim, did you have interest in that? I would step down if you wanted that. That's. But you said you're on the ballot. I, I'll be on the ballot, but they'll put somebody else on the ballot. To, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of a slam dunk. I was going to move up uh, a notch this year, but uh, um, I, I'm perfectly capable of coming in there. But I don't want if you're on the ballot, and that's that's beneficial to us as a county and having you in that that leadership position on that. I don't want to sidetrack that by any means. Well, it does put us on the executive committee, is yeah. Yes. So I just assume that of. that way. We just change you to 2022, so it's still in the notes. Yeah, that's yeah. an interest. Yeah. yeah, I prefer to stay in it too. Yeah, feel pretty strongly about that. So, all right. So then. So I'll just add um, right and to extension, and I'll just move that note to be for next year. Yes. So I'll say Lisa and Felix. And what else, anything else, then, Keisha? Just a, just a correction on MCIT. I think you should remove uh, second Friday each month is not a meeting for the voting delegate. Yeah, I, I was going to work with, um, if you're okay with it, uh, Robin said she'd help me kind of clarify that language since you had flagged it last time. We didn't get it quite right this time. Yeah. All right. You know, and I don't know if it's appropriate with AMC Futures to be added. That was, they've selected me to be on Futures. I don't know. Would that fall under um, the ones near the end? Yeah, would that fall? I mean, because everybody has an assignment with one of the. That. Uh, the policy committees are assigned by commissioners. I think that's what you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. And then there are some that are serving on other uh, special AMC committees. So we, we okay. could just add the Futures Committee and list Commissioner for That's what I'd okay. Add Futures Committee yeah. and put. Okay. And then we'll correct that MCIT language. Those meetings are not, as you said, that's. All you need to do is board. remove that language. Correct. We, we appoint one annual voting yep. delegate for the annual meeting, and that's. Yep. And Keisha, Futures meets quarterly. Quarterly? Okay. That's helpful. 
anybody see anything else? No, it's uh, with the AMC district. My term was extended a year because of COVID. Uh, so I don't know if you want that on there or not, what it's for what it's worth. So for district five? Yep. Yep. Five, district yeah. five. Okay. We'll add that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think anybody that we are any organization we're involved with, I think needs to be shown. All right, anything else? If not, then I would be looking for, do we need a, a motion to approve the um, commissioner committee assignments as amended for 2021? I'll move approval. Motion made by Commissioner Foby. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Dolan. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Okay, now moving on to our update on COVID-19 and county response. Amanda, here's our dashboard. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, I have Nicole in the room, our new uh, public health manager, CHS administrator, hopefully. Um, and I think that uh, appointment request will be coming to you at our next board meeting, but um, she'll probably start to transition on these reports. So I just wanted to have her down here. Um, so good morning, uh, COVID update for you. Um, statewide, we have 423,688 COVID cases. That's an increase of 3,148 from the day prior. You'll see here on our dashboard, the Sherburne County cases. So uh, for our county, we have 7,862 uh, cases of COVID since the start. Um, 297 have been hospitalized, 66 in the ICU, and 65 deaths. Um, obviously, that seven-day average number continues to trend downward, so that's a good sign, and we'll take it. Keisha, if you want to go to the first PowerPoint for me. Um, we took December off um, for our school uh, partners, and we are reconvening again this Friday um, with our area superintendents, um, but we still are actively engaged with our superintendents and our school partners. We still have a Thursday weekly meeting uh, with the COVID coordinators and the building principals, and so they're still continuing to get the information. Also, um, now that the governor has issued um, back to school recommendations for elementary, a lot of school partners are submitting those plans, those safety plans um, to resource. That's our area co-op um, that kind of makes those determinations if they're able to come back and if they have the necessary safety protocols. And so we've also been um, in those meetings with our school partners and resource. Um, so here's a, a, a snapshot of our monthly COVID cases. Obviously, November was our high month at almost 4,000 cases for the month. Um, December, uh, a pretty significant drop, 50%, um, yet still our highest month. Um, so we had 1,715 cases uh, in the month of December. Here's that running 14-day formula again. So Thursday's release had Sherburne County at 75.51, and this Thursday we are projecting uh, 53.2. Um, again, uh, counties are at various stages of um, their projections and how much effort that they're putting into the tracking these numbers. Um, so I don't necessarily have projections of our surrounding counties of where they're going to be on Thursday, um, but where they were last Thursday was Stearns as was at 67, Wright was at 77, Benton 75, Anoka 43, and Mille Lac 70. So again, regionally, uh, we're pretty on par with where our partners are. And again, this is just that daily count. So you can see that um, where we've been trending pretty drastically downward. Again, it's a good news. Now we're kind of going to be hovering in that 50 to 40 range. And I've been keeping um, a close eye on the daily counts and, and we might be there to stay. So. Um, and as I just said, uh, elementary schools uh, can go back to school effective January 18th, but they need to uh, adhere to safety requirements. Um, and then resources are local co-op that makes those determinations. Oops, excuse me. Um, 
On to vaccine. Uh, so as of Monday, statewide, there have been 78,402 vaccines administered. And again, this is statewide, so this is not only public health, but this is the pharmacy partners as well as our hospitals. Um, however, Minnesota as a state has received 300,000 doses of vaccine. So really only 30% of the vaccine that the state has received has uh, gone out the door and been administered administered. Uh, so the state is really working quickly to distribute. At the same time, they are working um, carefully and prudently to make sure that they are gathering the ne necessary input and that that vaccine really goes out to those most at risk. Um, however, the state has told us that uh, the expectation is that all folks in that priority 1A population will be vaccinated with their first dose by the end of January. Um, so if you want to go to our next PowerPoint, um, yes, question. I'm sorry. Absolutely. Um, in this, um, first tier, and there is some indication that not everybody is wanting to be vaccinated. That is correct. Um, so with that being said, how long are they going to leave that open before they move on to the next tier? If there's like, um, and I don't know what the percentage is. Are they tracking who are not wanting to be vaccinated? I might have the answer to your second question and some of my later remarks, okay. maybe not the first question. Um, just a reminder of who's in that uh, priority 1A that for local public health are within that priority 1A, they've broken it into a first tier, first priority, second priority, third priority, even within that uh, phase 1A tier. So for local public health, um, our first priority was to vaccinate EMS law enforcement, fire, um, as well as folks who are involved in vaccination clinics. So to your point, Commissioner, um, within our law enforcement group, there are 357 um, EMS uh, law enforcement fire within Sherburne County and only 120 chose to be vaccinated, opted in. Um, and so then knowing that we had 200 doses uh, that first week, we really worked to um, get those doses into the arms of Sherburne County folks. Uh, and so then we opened up our vaccination to those involved in the ICS chart, as well as those nurses who are administering vaccine clinics, as well as school nurses knowing that they're going to have a role in vaccination clinics. Yeah, I just would not, based on that, I mean, this is voluntary. This is not yes, a mandatory vaccination. So by voluntary, I just want to make sure that once the you've had the opportunity, and if you do not choose to do it, we can move on fairly quickly Absolutely. to that next level. Absolutely. Um, that second tier um, of folks, our second priority within that 1A is alternative or assisted living facilities. This local public health works really in more of an assurance role. So uh, the assisted living facilities really are covered by that pharmacy program. However, in Sherburne County, there are eight that are not connected either to a healthcare system or to that pharmacy program. And so in that role, we really um, work to assure that they were gonna be connected with a state level vaccinator. We did our due diligence on that and there's only one assisted living facility, a very small home in Big, uh, Big Lake, I believe, um, with eight residents that um, wasn't connected with a state level vaccinator and so we're going to take on the responsibility of vaccinating those folks. So then we got permission now to move on to that third priority in 1A. And so this is a slide uh, that just came out on December 31st. Um, so the third priority population in phase 1A is all remaining health care personnel um, that aren't included in that first or second priority group that are unable to telework. So uh, we, when we get this guidance, we need to read it a few times to make sure we're understanding exactly what MDH is saying, who we're allowed to vaccinate. So really, this definition is healthcare personnel that both work in hospitals, um, ambulatory and outpatient settings, home health care, emergency shelters, long-term care facilities, dentists, pharmacies, mental behavioral health settings, correctional settings, and group homes. I got really excited when I read that because I thought the floodgates were going to open, but then I was quickly reminded by my staff that really we need to take all of those populations and it's healthcare personnel who are not able to telework. Um, and so we are working now on making connections. We already have relationships with a lot of these groups through our child and teen checkup outreach um, and some other services, our group home um, workers, and so really contacting to say, who is that, how many staff, and now here's the language, so how many are going to opt to receive the vaccine? And is that gonna be our 
charge? Yes, that is our responsibility. Okay. And again, we had to wait until we got permission um, from MDH to move on to that. Um, and then, to your point again, Commissioner, so then that finishes up that priority 1A population. And then we move on to 1B, which is a very broad group. Uh, the state is asking for public comment on 1B workers to say what will be the prioritization even within this 1B group. And so um, that closes on the 11th and hopefully we'll have guidance then on that. So this is gonna be really small print and I'm sorry, I wish I had a different uh, layout to show you, but um, that first priority you'll see is the light pink and then it moves on to second priority and then that third priority. And then this phase 1B is essential workers. So that's when we get to public health and human services staff who are not involved in vaccination clinics. Then we get into local law enforcement, fire, public safety and first responders. But remember, all of ours in Sherburne County respond to medical, so they fit that first priority definition. Other mission critical. Here we get to K through 12 school workers, child care workers, utility workers. This is when we are able to also go into our corrections facilities and um, vaccinate both inmates and staff. Um, all congregate care settings, critical manufacturing, postal workers. So really it's a broad group of essential workers. And so there will, there will be a prioritization um, matrix within this. And so we will again await that guidance. But again, the state has given us until the end of January now to finish up vaccinating this 1A population. So Amanda, um, just a quick question. This, a lot of the schools are planning to go back with um, K through um, five, is it? Um, elementary, yeah. Elementary, and so there's no opportunity for any of the teachers or any of those um, workers to get vac vaccinated before that. Not at this time, no. So it would have to be into, we'd be into February, March. Yep. And again, we really, pro we vaccinate under MDH's guidance in terms of prioritization. Okay, yeah. thank you. And then I just wanted to show this, um, and again, see the, the disclaimer up there, tentative, be flexible. Um, on December 23rd, we received our first 200 doses of the Moderna vaccine. A week later, the next Wednesday, we, we received another 200 doses. Today, we will be receiving 100 doses. We don't know from week to week if we're going to be receiving doses and how many doses we'll uh, be receiving. So again, it's really, really hard for us to plan for clinics and also um, get it out the door because we don't know from week to week what we're receiving. And so they released this and my takeaway from this is that we can make an assumption that if we're vaccinating and we're getting vaccine out the door that we can probably uh, expect to receive a readiness survey saying, do you want more vaccine um, every week? So wanted to let you all know that to date, Sherburne County again has received 400 doses with another 100 doses arriving today. 170 of those doses have been administered and we now have three more clinics planned. So January 23rd and January 26th will be the second dose to the first group, so that first 170, because um, that is 28 days now following um, their first dose. On Tuesday, January 12th, so next week, next Tuesday, we are preparing for a clinic to get those 330 doses out the door. So our plan for this is any law enforcement that had originally declined who now wanna opt in, will be offering it back to those folks. I think there were 10 uh, law enforcement folks that got deferred because of any number of reasons. They weren't feeling good, they had a close contact, um, they had vaccines uh, prior to 14 days. So we'll be um, offering it up to those folks that one assisted living home in Big Lake will be uh, offering it up to those. And then we're moving on to the healthcare providers that fit that third priority definition. Um, I have fielded quite a few questions from quite a few people over the last week about why are we sitting on X number of doses? How soon can we get those out the door? Because it's been pretty well publicized, obviously in the Star News, how many doses uh, that we were able to get out the door. And I think it was also posted in terms of how many doses we had received. 
Um, I have heard loud and clear from this board that vaccination is our number one priority, and uh, I just want to thank you for that and just know that that is our number one priority, too. That is where all of our efforts are going right now. Um, however, it's not as easy as receiving the vaccine and being able to administer it. And again, in my earlier remarks, I said that only 30 percent of the vaccine that Minnesota as a state has um, received has gone out the door. Um, so really, we can only move as fast as MDH will allow us, and we just got permission uh, on the 31st to move to this third priority group. So we're moving very fast and very quickly. And that group is a little less shovel ready than our law enforcement partners because we know the chiefs, That's uh, that communication is already there. So we're doing a little more legwork uh, on this group. Um, and then also um, we want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence with all the tiers ahead of that. So this is complex. We're building the ship as we sail it, um, but we are working as hard as we can, as, as fast as we can, and I'm pretty excited that um, we're able to at least schedule a clinic for next week, Tuesday, to try as hard as we can to get 300 doses out the door. Great, Amanda. Mr. Smeezy. I, I have a question and then a comment. Yes, sir. Uh, so we will be in receipt of 500 doses. Yes, sir. Is that first dose, second dose? Is that enough to do 500 people, or is that enough to do 250? 250. 250. That's a great question. Um, no, that is our first do dose. So once we accept the 200 doses or however much, um, MDH puts it into their plans that we'll be re just automatically receiving that other second dose 28 days later. Okay, so and that's not in your numbers? No, so, that's not. Okay, so we have 1,000 doses. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I'm just reporting on the confirmation from MDH of okay. how many doses we'll be receiving. And, the, and then my comment is, I, I, you know, I appreciate all that you folks are doing. And I, I, I look at this as, as just as important as having someone answer that phone call when they dial 911. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think we can do anything anymore to impact the people in Sherburn County and in this central Minnesota than getting them vaccinated mm -hmm. at this point. So... I appreciate that you that you put that top priority on it. I understand that you're constrained by uh, by the state and by others that you have to work within those guidelines. I appreciate that, but I, I do I think it's I think it's very important that we recognize that this has to be uh, our number one priority to try and get that vaccine in the arms of whoever will take it as we're allowed to do so. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah, and I want to concur. Exactly what Commissioner Smeezing said. Um, Amanda, you have done an excellent job with your leadership through this, and we understand too that it would be nice if sometimes the people up the ladder would get out of the way, <laughs> so to speak, respectively meant. Uh, but you guys have done a phenomenal job of um, reacting to this, and I just think I've heard too through some of the um, Sit, sitting in on some of the um, unified command meetings, the first couple of um, vaccination clinics that you did and that you guys organized were, it was a huge success. Um, a lot of people are saying how seamless it went. So kudos to you guys for that. Um, also want to make sure that we recognize that um, along with you guys and then Dan um, Weber and all his work in a very difficult situation of COVID, um, in keeping us um, going and the leadership that you guys have stepped forward with is phenomenal. So thank you on behalf of this board. Thank you, um, thank you very much. Madam Chair. Yes. Quick question, Amanda. On the, at the state level, as far as uh, vaccines coming into the state level, do we, is that on any type of regularity? Are they getting, how far in advance do they know what they're getting at the state level? You know, I, there's a lot of phone calls every week, and I'm not participating in those. I don't know, Nicole, do you have any sense of that? I think it's similar to what we're experiencing. There's maybe a short turnaround. So, yes, we have the doses, and yes, how many can local public health get out as soon as possible? Okay, so at the state level, we don't have a tremendous amount of, they don't have a tremendous amount of forecasting what's going to be available either. I'm assuming they're in very much the same situation as we are. Sure. Madam Chair, yeah. I, mean, I would assume they don't have they don't have control over when when it comes, but they do have control over how it goes out and how we get it into people once it gets here. Mm -hmm. And I think you know our expectation should be 
that they're as expedient as they possibly can. Yeah, right. yeah and my comment was more just kind of looking at, from the, the cautious end of it and why they're being cautious. Uh, obviously, you know, at 300,000 doses, that's really only 150,000 people. And if they don't know when more is coming, they can't keep building that backlog, backlog of second doses. So to people that are wondering why it's not going out quicker, if we can't forecast 30 days out, it's pretty much impossible to dig yourself into too big of a hole there. And I also, we, we make remarks too, you know, that we understand that we're getting vaccine in people sooner than even some of our hospitals have vaccine in people. And I really think of it as swim lanes, you know, that that's the Pfizer vaccine. And that really is a part from what we're doing. Um, and same with the pharmacies. I don't know, I'm not keeping track of, you know, uh, the assisted living and the pharmacy program. Um, but what we're trying to control is what's in our swim lane and what we get allocated to us. And so I, I think that's important for the public to know that I recognize that even that first priority um, in 1A hasn't all been vaccinated. Yeah, and, and just based on, you know, the questions I get are generally, why can't it get rolled out faster? So I just wanted to be sure to be able to answer that question if people ask it. So. Absolutely. And just as a, um, with our um, wellness ban, how is that coming in? Is, are there plans on utilizing the wellness ban to get the vac vaccines out there to the public in the county as well? Yes, great question. Um, I just heard from Sergeant Buller that uh, the wellness van is ahead of schedule maybe even, I don't wanna jinx it, but that it will be here by February 1st, so I'm hanging my hat on that. Um, we also just authorized two transportable coolers, if you will, for vaccine, and so we are ready. Again, it's difficult without the priorities being laid out to know who we're vaccinating next, but we know that we're gonna be on the road. Schools is a great example. We know whenever we're able to vaccinate them, we'll be going to them, and that mobile wellness van will be a great opportunity. Um, just that already has the vaccine storage, that has the refrigerator. Um, we will not be vaccinating in the wellness van because we wouldn't be able to adhere social distancing within that. But again, it's, it's a good. But yet it's a good tool to use for your transportation Absolutely. efforts. Plus Absolutely. it's also a tool that will be sitting out front of wherever you're vaccinating. Yeah. Absolutely. As, um, um, yeah, no, I think that that was a good move for that wellness van. So thank you for those. Um, um, thoughts and planning for that as well. All right, any other questions for Amanda? Nope. All right, thank you very much. Um, if if uh, you're comfortable, we'll switch to Dan. Yes. Or did you want to take your break now? It's, I don't know what your thoughts are, so I thought we could wrap this up. And... No, we can just wrap this up. Okay. I just want to give a quick update on the business relief grants. So it did go live last week, and I'm happy to report that we did receive the state money yesterday. There was some concern that it might be next week, but we did get it yesterday. So we've had over 31 applications already. I think a couple more just came in, and I do expect to get some money out the door this week already. A lot of the applications are coming in incomplete, so there's a lot of follow-up that's involved in that, but uh, we will have at least six or seven that will get funding on Friday already. Diane, right? I'm, I'm okay saying that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we will get that out. Uh, going forward, I will provide a list to the board in the board packet of awardees, so you'll know who got the money and from what communities they came from. And uh, we have had to deny a few applications because it is a November, December time period that we're comparing 19 to verse 20, and some of them aren't showing a significant loss in that period. And B, a lot of them are home-based businesses, and at least for this round, we made them have a commercial address to qualify for the program. So if we do do a round two, maybe that's something we could look at to help out home base. But so far, those are the couple. And we have had some from other counties apply. Obviously, they do not qualify for the Sherman County grant. But okay. that's where we are right now, and if you have any questions, just let me know. I do also want to say um, thank you, too, for um, putting together this card. If anybody wants to grab a few here from um, the dais to go around and um, give to your businesses in your communities and stuff, they're here and available. Thank and you also, for reminding me. We did go out and um, drop those off on Thursday of last week and yesterday. So we did hit every community for the restaurants and the fitness centers received those cards. Yes, and I do want to thank you for that. That was um, Dan and then Dave, um, I heard, was out and about with you as well. So right. thank you very much for those extra efforts. I did hear back from a business that was totally excited that, um, that you had stopped by, and they really, really were appreciative. 
of that. So thank you for going above and beyond and getting those messages out. Commissioner Dolan. Dan, quick question. Are you seeing, as far as tier one, tier two, are you seeing any from that tier one, any applications? Yes, we are. Uh, some restaurants did not qualify for the state money because of the 30% drop in revenue that's required. So we are definitely a higher percentage of tier two, but we do have some tier ones as well, especially the fitness centers that most of them are qualifying under the tier one for sure. Okay. And have you heard back, Dan, from some of the businesses? I've heard that based on what they're um, needing for information from um, the showing the loss. Unfortunately, they're being kind of like penalized because of the open time frame. So they're not really able to show the loss of what they've been experienced through the whole time frame. Is that Correct. Well, the state program seeks quarter two and quarter three okay. losses of over 30% to qualify. Ours is November, December, which is truly when the last executive order kicked in. And that's what the intent of our program was, was for those quarter four losses. That's certainly something we can look at at round two, but when we developed this program, we were looking at those quarter four losses. Okay. Madam Chair, and we, we kind of, Dan kind of glanced over and it was a little little humble about it too. I'd, I'd urge the public and us as commissioners when we're encouraging these businesses to apply for these, emphasize to fill them out completely and provide the right information because it slows everybody down and just grinds things to a halt uh, to have Dan having to chase around little bits and pieces of, of paper that are clearly asked for at the beginning. So just take your time and fill it out right um, so everybody can get their money quicker. And do we have enough information on the federal um, program that is um, out to give to people as well for, you know, you might not qualify for this, or even if you do, make sure you check out this. I've got a, um, I've got a, a, a a nice summary I'll put together for you to hand out if that'll work for you. Um, yeah, we've got some bullets to explain what it does. On that note, uh, with the postcards, uh, I think we started just giving you 10 today or 15. Um, depending on how much you're out in your district, if you need more, just let us know. Okay. And it will be in the local papers too. It was in the Elk River Star, we were able to get it to them, and it'll be in the Union and the Patriot next week. Okay. Um, just a real quick question, Dan. Did, have you noticed out of the applications that have come in so far, are these um, applicants that have um, applied last time around or are some of them new? That's a good question. I just looked at this that this morning. It's about half and half. So we're getting new applicants this good. time around. Good. That's good to hear. All right. Any other questions for Dan? And then again, Dan, thank you guys so much for the extra effort that you're going above and beyond. Um, getting out there and getting that word out there for our businesses. Thank you so much for all of your hard work. Thank your staff too. Thank you. All right. And then just to uh, wrap up uh, the summary for you or update, um, we will still have, at least for the next couple of weeks, uh, uh, Unified Command at nine o'clock on Wednesdays. Um, really, this is very clearly a public health led initiative right now. And the last thing we want to do is get in, 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 in a way of Amanda, but just for a coordinating and a, a little bit of a reflecting body, uh, we'll still meet for at least a couple of weeks. And then the sheriff and I are of the opinion that if it's clearly established and we have communication and we have policies and procedures, then we could probably stand down the unified command meetings and just react as needed to public health. But uh, they've really done an amazing job of putting together an entire instant command structure, protocol procedures, they've done two clinics already. So uh, really the value added is more of a communication coordination at this point than a policy making body, so. Okay. Thank you for that information. All right, moving then on to our commissioner's correspondence, committee reports and such, who's ready? Who wants to go first? Don't jump at once. Barb, are you ready? I can start nope, us off. I can first. start us out if you want. That's pretty He's, sure. He was on vacation, so he's next to us. <laughs> well, we had, we had the holiday in there, oh, so there true. wasn't a tremendous <laughs> amount. Um, I had uh, EDA meeting and then master planning kickoff meeting um, with Parks um, on the Weiss property. Then um, special, special meeting on the 29th. Um, and a broadband discussion that I think um, 
Rayanne was on that discussion as well, and that's going to be brought back in, in next meeting's workshop, it sounds like. Uh, Dan will probably go over the details of that a little bit. And I think that is it. Great. Commissioners from Museum. Okay. Uh, well, some unified command meetings. Uh, Get an EDA meeting on the 17th. Uh, we had some MCIT meetings, special board meeting, and that's all that I have, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Commissioner Kobe. Um, I had an AMC Futures uh, leadership meeting from River. One watershed, one plan policy meeting. I had a board of soil and water meeting. I had tri-cap meeting. Also tri-county solid waste strategic planning meeting. Um, then I took a little holiday break. <laughs> <laughs> Special county board meeting. And then this week, I uh, was at the Zimmerman City Council meeting last night. All right. Commissioner Buran. And I had a healthy Minnesota partnership meeting on the 15th after our board meeting. I had a BOA meeting on the 22nd and a special meeting on the 29th, and that's all. Great, thank you. Um, I had an EDA meeting on the 17th. Um, I also had um, a meeting with Bruce on the 18th, and a meeting with staff on the 21st just to get some organization for um, the role as chair. Had a county unified command meeting on the 23rd, special board meeting on the 29th, um, county unified command meeting on the 30th and also as Tim referred to um, a zoom call with um, broadband discussion and that was it for me just a note to the the commissioners that weren't part of the EDA the EDA meeting we did implement the or started to implement the changes to the new EDA in January so everybody that was on the EDA um, resigned and those positions will be filled by the new applicants um, in that new form of the EDA this month. So yeah. and went it, smoothly. And the EDA, I think, will be meeting at 6 o'clock instead of 8.30. The first meeting, I the think, was meeting, moved to yes, the EDA. To get an understanding of when the new board, the new body would want to meet. All right. Um, that pretty much um, concurs our regular agenda business. So um, I would be adjourning this meeting. And do we need a break before we go into workshop? Okay, we're going to have about a five five minute break enough. Yeah, it, just to note that Commissioner uh, Barant and Commissioner um, Dolan are scheduled to do some Board of Adjustment interviews at noon. So okay. if we could reconvene at 1130 and give uh, Amanda and her team Perfect. a half hour to at least go. And then if those two commissioners, if you go later, just know that they'll be sneaking out. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. We are